Hello and welcome to episode three of On Teaching Math. And in this episode, what I'm going to help you, the teacher, with is to come up with ways that you can teach your students how to tackle inequalities in one variable in a way that establishes well, a deeper understanding and establish some concepts that are going to be greatly useful in the future. You see, when students come across this, this is the very first time they'll probably ever have seen graphs and they're ever, it's the first time they're ever going to be able to or be asked to translate English into algebra. They're going to have to read all these symbols. It's also the first time that they're going to come across problems that have more than one answer. And so between all of this, there's a there's a lot going on with this topic. And so while you sure you can just teach students some shortcuts and they can get the answers right for these simple problems that we're going to discuss today, it'll be at the expense of missing a great opportunity to help prepare your students for the future. So I'm going to ask you ahead of time, if you think that this video would be useful for somebody else, hey, give it a, a like, give it a thumbs up. And if you think that you would like to be notified when there's more videos like this released, hey, go ahead and subscribe. It's free. Why not, right? So anyway, hey, let's get to it, shall we? So what we're going to do at the very beginning is we're going to get students talking and thinking about some questions about numbers that they're rather intuitive. So we're going to do it right across the board just like this. And if you'd like the PowerPoint that I use for this video, I've adjusted it to use it in a classroom. I'll put a link in the description below. It'll take you to my website where you can download it for free. So anyway, first thing first, we're going to ask them, hey, what is the number five? You're going to have them think about it. Then you're going to have them discuss. Most likely, they're going to come up with some, well, some natural number solutions, four, three, two, one. And you've got to push them a little deeper. So you can ask them, for example, like, what's the smallest number? Eventually, somebody's going to spit out negative infinity. That's not really a number, but hey, we're in the right direction. And then the tricky part. What's the biggest answer? Well, there isn't one. It, it goes all the way up to five, but it doesn't include five. And now this is a little tricky because, you know, 4.9 repeating forever is really five. But we're not going to really get into the fact that this isn't really a number. We'll discuss it and we'll discuss that you can get as close as you want to five, but five's not included. And that's it, right? So after we've had the students talk about all these things, we go ahead and summarize what it is that they came up with. Now, we don't want to provide this for them. And if they come up with this as a group really quickly, great. We're moving on fast. If it takes them a while, that's okay. It's worth the time because we've got to get them to, well, uncover any sort of misconception or misunderstanding they may have about numbers and the order of numbers and all that kind of stuff. And if we do that now at the beginning, it's a lot easier than later where that misconception might be hidden and just causing them to get wrong answers. And it's hard to determine why. So we're going to run through the same thing with a few other questions. And as you're going to see, as we work through this lesson, we're going to be, well, what we're doing here is we're really getting them to address the difference between a strict inequality like this and a not strict inequality like this. So once again, you give them the same question, ask them, you know, What's the smallest? What's the largest? This one's a little different. And students are often going to get confused with the word or. They confuse the word or with the meaning of the word and. And so you can help them to understand this. You see, two is a solution because it is it is not greater than itself, but it is equal to itself. And one or the other has to be true. That's what or means. And so you can walk, you can talk through its students through that. And, and it really helped them to understand. But that is a common misconception that causes students to have a little trouble. And it only comes out when they start thinking about what the meaning is. If all the students are ever doing is thinking about, well, how do I get the answer? Then that's never going to get uncovered. But it's always going to be causing some, some trouble for them, right? So anyway, anyway, once again, we're going to work through this the whole way. This third one is a combination of the first two. Right. And so we're going to run them through the whole thing. We're going to get them to see that, hey, this this third this third question, what number is less than five, but greater than or equal to negative two? Well, that's a combination of the first two. And then the third one is really strange. What number is not three? And so we're going to help them articulate in English all four of those answers. Right. And you can if you feel the students need more of this. You can give them more. If they've got it, then this would be sufficient, right? So now, after we have them 
thinking correctly about the answers to these questions. We're going to help them to graph. Now, they can discover the answers to this by talking to one another, but a graph has some convention that we need to teach them about. So we're, going to, we're just going to walk them through it, right? This is a number line, and we're going to put the number 5 on the number line. What we're really going to be doing is we're going to be graphing this first one. We're not going to tell them. We're not going to tell them that we're graphing this right away. We're just going to graph it. We're going to give them another example of what this kind of question or what this kind of information could look like in a picture. Because that's what a graph is. It's a picture of all the solutions. So here's a number line. This is the number 5. To the left of 5 are all the numbers that are smaller than 5. And to the right of 5 is all the numbers that are, in fact, of course, larger than 5, right? So if we get rid of one of those, like this right here, this is now a picture of all the numbers that are less than 5, but don't include 5. And the circle is key right? And so now we're going to change it. We're going to put a solid dot there. And now what we have is a picture of all the numbers that are smaller than five, including the number five. And so we need our students to understand that the way we distinguish between a strict inequality with like this and a not strict inequality is with something like this. So now here where I live, we use circles for strict inequalities and, and a solid dot for included. Some places use a curved parentheses and a square bracket, but hey, whatever, it's all the same concept. It's just written a little differently, right? So now hopefully students are gonna recognize that what we just did is we drew a picture of this. There's infinitely many answers, so we could never write them all. So what we do is we draw a picture. This is a picture of this question. This is a statement that matches this picture. So this graph matches the statement, and the statement answers the question. And that's why we graph. You see, if we just had a simple thing like x equals 7, well, there's no sense in graphing that because you're not going to glean any information from the graph that you wouldn't be able to get just from reading the statement. But here... When we start graphing, we're starting to talk about solution sets, often infinite numbers of solutions. And, and so drawing a graph is a way to represent an idea that's easy to understand, well, easier than if it was written out. So now, here's the other thing we got to get our students to understand about the graph. Everything that is shaded or the direction the arrow is going, that's where all of the solutions are. And anything that's not shaded is not an answer. So students need to explicitly understand that this is true. That's why we shade it to the left here, because all the numbers that are smaller than 5 are to the left, and this says what number is less than 5. So everything to the left would be a solution to this question, right? All right, now, we're going to work through uh, the number, anything, everything except for the number 3, because what we shade is an answer, and the way we say something like this is not included is we just put a circle around it. So this would be a picture, this right here, three with a circle around the three and an arrow headed, heading in both directions means that three is not included and that's what the picture would look like. All right, so now what we need our students to be able to do next is to try to graph this one and I would have them do it on their own. They should be able to come up with that and then to see if they can put this one together. Now this one's tricky because it's a compound inequality and it involves both of the first two. And so in order to do this, well, the students have to combine these two graphs. Now anything past five doesn't work because it says that it's less than five. And anything less than negative two doesn't work because it's got to be greater than negative two, greater than or equal to negative two. And so what we're trying to do here, right, is we first got the students to read the questions come up with solutions or answers to these questions just by talking about it and thinking about it. And then we, we annotated their answers on the board. And now we're teaching them to draw pictures of these answers. And so that's what we've got here so far, right? Now, we've got to get students to understand that a graph is a picture of all the solutions. So this is a picture that matches these words. And we also got to, we have to get them to understand that solutions are values that make a statement true. They, they, they satisfy a, straight, a statement. And so this is a picture that matches these words. And these, this right here is an answer to this question. That's what we're working at. All right. Now, moving on, we're going to have to teach the students how to translate these questions and these answers and these pictures 
into algebra, and to do so, they have to know what all these symbols mean. Now, of course, everybody probably, most students probably already know the less than, the greater than, and the greater than, the less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. However, um, they often forget what they really mean. You see, less than right here is this symbol. And we need to use the words less than when we use the symbol. We need to make our students use the words less than when they use this symbol. Okay? So we introduce them to this. We set that expectation that they have to use these words when they describe these symbols. We don't want to hear crocodile or any of that kind of nonsense. We want, we don't want to say pointing to the left. None of that. That's not what it means. We need the meaning because from the meaning comes all kinds of consequences and ideas that, well, keep us from getting in trouble, right? So now, here's what we got. We got these symbols, and now we're going to teach them how to write. So we're going to say we're going to use the variable x. x is the thing we don't know, right? So in this, in this first question, it says, what number? Well, we're going to say that what number is the variable x, and is less than 5 is less than is this symbol. So is less than 5. What number is less than 5? Well, that's just going to be x is less than 5. Writing it in, in algebra, we just use this symbol. This means exactly what number is less than 5. That's what it means. And, of course, this is the answer written out in English. And this is a picture of all of the answers, you know, in a graph, right? So we've got to get our students to use these symbols and use the language correctly, and then they're going to stay a little bit out of trouble, right? So we want to run them through to, to write equations for the, the second and the last, and we're going to save this third one because this third one is a little tricky. In order to do the third one, the students have to be able to rephrase this. One of the ways I explain it is I pick a student who is, it doesn't even matter, taller or shorter than me. Let's, let's say I chose a student that was taller. I could say, you are taller than me or I am shorter than you. So you could say x is greater than negative 2, or you could also say that negative 2 is less than x. And this is what we're going to use. This, this variety of the statement, same meaning, but different, different phrasing, is what we're going to use for this part. And for the 5, we're going to write it just like that. And so this is going to be a tricky thing. It's something that you might need to kind of, well, come up with some extra examples for students in the in the moment to help them to be able to write that. But it's not a, a make or break deal because we're just introducing them to compound inequalities right now. We don't expect them to master it. What we're really getting at though is do they understand how this statement in algebra matches the graph, how the graph matches the answer written out in English, and how the answer is the correct answer to the question. We want to put we want them to put all of this together so that they can understand how to translate, how to read and write in algebra, how to translate from algebra to English, English algebra, how the graph matches all of it. It's a pretty complicated thing that's going on here. All right, so now, checkup time. We gotta, we have to give our chance, our students some chances to, to try some of this stuff, right? So um, in the PowerPoint, I'm going to give you a, a, a three, three questions, right? Students are going to try these. Your job is to, to just help them. Make sure. Force them to try. They can't just wait and then try to write down an answer and hope to learn. Because they already have, at their disposal, the understanding and the tools. They just have to learn how to use them. And the only way they're going to do that is if they take a chance, perhaps make a mistake. Anyway, your job is to encourage them to do that. And here, once again, we're having them rewrite this expression in a different way. This is a great, a great skill, something they're going to need to be able to do in the future, right? So another question, you know, can you write a statement and an algebraic inequality that matches the graph below? So here's the graph. Ah, <laughs> here's the graph, right? So we're going to give them this graph and we want them to make this this algebraic statement that matches that right there. And in English, it would be what number is greater than or equal to negative four. All right, so we want to be able to do all those things. And then, last up, we want them to write, to graph, and write a, a statement that matches this compound inequality. So we can run them through all that kind of stuff and help them. It's no big deal. It gives us an idea where they're at at the end of the day, though, right? And so, it's still running them through, making sure that they understand that 4 is a boundary. You can go all the way up to, but you cannot include 4. And 5 is included. And another another thing that can kind of come out of this question between 4 and 5, there are actually infinitely many numbers. But students sometimes 
they forget that or they struggle to remember it. And it's not just all the fractions. It's not just all the decimals. It's, it's all of the irrational numbers too. For example, uh, the square root of 24 is in here. The square root of 17 is in here. There's all kinds of numbers in between four and five that we want our students to be thinking about. So then a little closure to help out the, to help the students make sense of all this. And there's a homework assignment that you can get access to at my webpage. I'll put a link in the description below. But anyway, some questions to facilitate some conversation to kind of to compress the things they've learned for the day are here. You can run the students through that. And, and there you go. That's a one day lesson that should really help the students understand what a graph is, how to make sense of an algebraic expression so they can, they can translate it into English. They can think about what the answers are. So they're not just following a, a set of steps and if then statements. And then what's going to happen is when they really understand what a graph is and they're really reading the, the algebra and they're making sense of it numerically with concrete thinking, what's going to end up happening is when they move on to uh, linear equations, for example, they're going to be much better prepared and that's going to go faster. So this extra day spent here, just teaching them how to graph, not how to solve, just how to graph, how to read, how to write is well worth the time. So anyway, I have a podcast episode, it's episode number seven, that discusses this very thing, and there's lots of other great podcasts there. You can go to my website, thebeardedmathman.com, check that out. Take a look around. There is a ton. There are a ton of resources on the website, all free, to help you become a teacher that can focus on things conceptually. You can develop mathematical literacy in your students. Anyway, it's a huge undertaking, and I do it because I feel that teaching kids conceptually is well worth the extra effort, but there's not a lot of there's not a lot of support out there for us teachers willing to take up that that task. So I'm putting this together to help you guys out, to help your students out, so that well we can have better outcomes. So anyway, if you like the video, hey, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to be contacted of when more are released, hey, please subscribe and share it on social media. Hey, my name is Philip Brown, and I want to thank you once again for your time, and I hope you found this useful. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think after you try it out. Tell me how your students did, what went well, what didn't well go well. Hit me up. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Thank you for watching.